Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic, we're going to look at the representation of real numbers. Specifically, we will look at the double precision floating point format. So in this topic, we will consider representations of real numbers. We will describe a simplified six digit floating point representation. We will look at the relative error, addition, multiplication, and issues with this floating point representation. We will discuss special numbers, such as the representation of zero, denormalized, infinity, and indeterminate numbers. We will describe the double precision floating point format following this. We will consider some of its properties, and then we will actually perform addition and multiplication on double precision floating point numbers. If we were to start simply with a double precision floating point representation, we'd start as follows. It is eight bytes or 64 bits where the first bit represents the sign, either zero for positive, one for negative. The next 11 bits represents the exponent. The remaining 52 bits represents the mantissa. Consequently, if the exponent is any value between 1 and 2046, this represents the following real number. It's actually a rational number, but it's, again, every rational number is real. If all of the bits in the exponent are 0, this represents this specialized denormalized number. If all the bits are one and all the bits in the mantissa are zero, this represents plus or minus infinity. And if all the bits in the exponent are one and the first bit of the mantissa is one, this actually is reserved for indeterminate results. 0 divided by 0, infinity minus infinity. This is also called not a number or NAN. Now, approaching the floating point number representation of real numbers using this binary representation makes it difficult at best to comprehend the design of this data structure or representation. First, there's far too many bits to easily, easily grasp the extremes. Also, everything is in binary. And so humans, while very familiar with decimal numbers, find it much more difficult to think in binary. Consequently, what we're going to do instead is we're going to start with a simpler decimal representation of real numbers. All right, so what's really interesting about this is all the design issues that we will deal with with a decimal representation and a much simpler decimal representation will have the similar consequences and effects on the design of the double precision binary representation of real numbers. Unlike integers, which can be represented exactly, real numbers cannot, but integers can be represented exactly. So suppose we wanted to restrict ourselves to using or storing integers using only six decimal digits. We could have a sign bit and six subsequent digits. This could allow you to store numbers in the range from approximately negative a million up to a million, minus one. Now, there is one problem with this representation. We do actually have two separate representations of zero. Now, this is solved for binary by using the twos complement representation. There is actually a tens complement representation of negative numbers for decimal numbers, but we won't go into this. However, if you ever get your hands on 
a cash register from the early 1900s or even late 1800s, you will find that it performs subtraction by converting a positive number to a corresponding negative number using tens complement and then adding the two results, giving a similar result as we found with twos complement for int, short, long, and even car. Now, to look at one way of representing real numbers, suppose we are restricted to performing some operations such as modeling processor usage. The amount of time or the percentage of time that a processor is executing performing useful operations may be any value between zero and one. One representing that the processor is performing useful operations 100% of the time, zero representing that the pr processor is entirely idle. We could represent processor usage using six digits as follows. The six digits represent the, in, the real number 0 0.nnnnnn. So this allows us to represent or approximate real numbers in the range from 0 up until, up until but not including 1 with various levels of precision. All right, this could be one potential way of storing a real number. We will store an integer, and that integer will then be interpreted as the mantissa of a real number. This is actually something that is done in many embedded real-time systems where it's too expensive to perform floating point computations. Alternatively, if we wanted to store small real numbers, we could instead interpret six digits as representing the following real number. So you'll notice here that the first three digits represents the integer component and the next three digits represents the mantissa. And once again, we could perform various floating point computations on this, such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. This would allow us to store any real number, at least approximately, on the range from negative 1,000 up until 1,000, and once again, with varying degrees of precision. Now, all such representations of real numbers using a fixed number of integers where the radix point or decimal point is placed somewhere explicitly in that range, these are all called fixed point representations. That is, the decimal point is fixed to a specific location relative to, say, the integer component or mantissa. Now, this is ideal if you know that the real numbers are guaranteed to be bounded on some range, say from 0 to 1 or from 0 to 256, if you were to, for example, store a short where the first byte represents the integer component up until 255, and the next byte represents the mantissa. Now, this is unfortunately, however, suboptimal if we wanted to represent a much more significant range of real numbers. Again, with either of these representations, we cannot represent numbers even as small as one million. So to represent a more general range of numbers, we're going to instead use a scientific notation approach that we've described previously.
Now, the scientific notation it has an integer component followed by mantissa, be it for decimal or for binary. In addition, in both cases, we have the base raised to an appropriate power. Now, IEEE 754 uses this approach in defining the double precision floating point representation, or double, representation of real numbers. Now, you as an engineer need to understand the reasoning behind the design, the choices that were made, and the consequent weaknesses, because these weaknesses will affect the algorithms and that we will use and create. Now, it is very difficult to describe the issues while simultaneously trying to describe a 64-bit binary number. Thus, instead, we are going to in we are going to have a six decimal digit representation of real numbers. And in every single way, this six decimal digit representation is going to parallel the IEEE 754 standard. Consequently, all the design features of this six digit representation will be faithful and parallel to the design for IEEE 754. Consequently, all the weaknesses of the, this six decimal digit representation will also parallel the weaknesses of the IEEE 754 64 bit binary representation. Therefore, if you understand this straightforward six decimal digit representation, you will also understand the IEEE 754 standard. Here is our representation. We have a plus or minus and then six digits. The first two digits will represent an exponent and the balance will represent the leading significant digit together with a mantissa. So as long as the exponent is any or any two digits between 00, zero and 98, this is going to represent the following real number. So n decimal or point MMM times 10 to the exponent minus 49. The minus 49 is going to be described as the bias. Now, for storing non-zero values, we are going to require that the integer component, the leading digit, is non-zero. And we will justify that at some point in the future. Now, with this representation, the smallest positive number is the following. The exponent is zero, the integer component is one, and all digits in the mantissa are zero. This represents 1.000 times 10 to the zero minus 49, or simply 10 to the negative 49. The largest positive number using this representation is 98999. Recall that we are not allowing the exponent to be 99, as we will use this subsequently to store other significant and useful values. So this is the largest number that can be stored in this representation. Consequently, this number represents 9.999 times 10 to the 98 minus 49, which is 9.999 times 10 to the 49, which is pretty close to 10 to the 50. So what's interesting here is that with 
just six decimal digits, we can represent all, or at least approximate, all real numbers on the range from 10 to the negative 49 up until 10 to the 50 with four digits of precision. And of course, the same for negative numbers as small as negative 10 to the neg uh, negative 10 to the 50. All right, because we are storing four digits of precision, that essentially means that we can store all such numbers with a relative error no greater than 5 times 10 to the negative 4, 4 being the fact that we are using four digits of precision. Consequently, the relative error is never greater than 0.05%. That's not bad. We can represent all numbers on this range with a relative error of no more than 0.05%. That's pretty good you, considering the fact that we are only using sec, six decimal digits. It's sort of interesting. With this representation, we can actually represent all real numbers all the way up to the square root of a Google. Now, suppose that we have this representation, but we want to add or multiply such numbers. That is, we'd like to do some arithmetic. Such operations occur as per normal. The only issue is that the result must ultimately be stored in the same given format. So for example, let us assume we want to add these two numbers. Well, the first number represents 7.235 times 10 to the 62 minus 49. The second number is 6.323 times 10 to the 62 minus 49. Now, we can perform this calculation, adding them together, and we get 13.558 times 10 to the 62 minus 49. Now, this has two digits in the integer component, so we can correct this by moving the decimal point and changing the exponent. So this is equal to 1.13558 times 10 to the 63 minus 49. How do we represent this in our format? Well, you have to remember that we can only store three digits in the mantissa. So the integer component plus three digits. So we now have to round this to four significant digits. And that means we have to store this as six, three for the exponent and one, three, five, six. Now, in all of this, notice that we never actually had to calculate what the explicit exponent was. We actually just calculated with the bias in mind. Now, if the exponents are different, addition is still reasonably straightforward. Suppose I wanted to add these two numbers. Okay. Well, let's take a look at what they represent. Well, the first number represents something times 10 to the 23 minus 49. The second represents something times 10 to the 25 minus 49. So the multipliers are different. However, notice that we can modify the first number so that it has the same multiplication by 10 to an exponent as the second. We moved the decimal places two places over to the left and added two to the exponent. Now the multipliers are the same and we can simply add the results. All right, that gives us 
8, 6 times 10 to the 25 minus 49. Once again, to store this in our standard representation, we must round to four significant digits. Rounding to four significant digits, that gives us 2, 5 for the exponent and 6, 3, 7, 8 for the integer component and the three digit mantissa. Consider this example. Suppose we want to add these two numbers. Now the exponents are slightly further apart. So once again, we're adding these two numbers together. Well, shifting the second gives us that we are adding these two numbers. And adding these two numbers gives us this result. Now, once again, we must round to four significant digits to store in our representation. And rounding this to four significant digits gives us this value here. Notice that this representation is unchanged from the larger of the two numbers we just added. Now, you'll notice that in the first two examples we just saw, we had to perform some rounding. Consequently, simply performing a single arithmetic addition results in an answer that is only an approximation of what the actual correct answer is. Therefore, this will introduce an error into our computations. Now that's an error introduced with simply one arithmetic operation. However, recall that with Gaussian elimination backward substitution, there is a significant number of arithmetic computations that are being performed. What this means is that if each of these arithmetic operations is introducing an error, then after performing dozens or even hundreds of calculations, how can we have any faith that the answer we have actually represents the real answer? In the third example, we had something even more bizarre we had something of the form x plus y, but when we added them together, we got x. Now, in secondary school, if you were given this equation, you would immediately state, ah, yes, y must equal zero. That's the only possibility. However, we see now with floating point numbers, this may not be the case. It is easy to add a very small number in magnitude to a larger number in magnitude and have no effect on the value of the larger number. All right, let's look at a slightly different example. Suppose we want to add these three numbers. Without performing the calculations explicitly, I'm just going to state that the sum of the first two numbers is 5.25748 times 10 to the 54 minus 49. And you can try this yourself. Now, in a computer, a computer may temporarily, in the floating point unit, store more digits than the representation. However, when a value is being stored in a register, we need to store it in the appropriate representation. Consequently, this number would be stored as 545257. Now, the next step is to add this calculation onto the third value. Again, without explicitly performing the calculation, I will just state that this results in 5.25715.93. And you should be able to deduce that that is indeed the correct sum. And this is again still multiplied by 10 to the 54 minus 49. 
Well, when we round to four digits, uh, we haven't affected the result at all because the third number is significantly smaller than the sum of the first two. Now, in adding these three digits, what happens if we instead add the second pair of integers first instead of the first? So now we're going to add the second and the third real numbers, or at least representations. If we add these two together, we get 2.36393 times 10 to the 52 minus 49. All right, storing this as six digits gives us positive 522364. Now, if we add this to the first number, we get 5.25764 times 10 to the 54 minus 49. Once again, this is stored now as positive 545258. Now, wait a second. When we added the first two and then added to that result the third, we got a different number. Which one is better? Which one is closer to the actual sum of these three numbers? Now, if we are not going to do the rounding in the intermediate steps and just simply sum these three together, then the actual result is 5.25763933 times 10 to the 54 minus 49. If we now round this final result to four digits, we now get 5.25763933. 258 times 10 to the 54 minus 49. Therefore, of the two computations we made, the one where we added the second and the third integer or representations first and then added to that the first gave us a better approximation with respect to relative error then by adding the first two and then adding the third. What this means for floating point numbers is the following. It is no longer true that x plus y added together plus z is equal to x plus the sum of y and z. That means that the adding of floating point numbers is no longer associative. This can be a significant issue to deal with because what this says is it now matters what order we add a string of numbers together. Now, beyond this course, but for now, I'm just going to state if you are adding positive numbers, it is generally best to add them from smallest to largest. Now, there is an issue here. Sorting a large list of numbers that you want to add can be an expensive operation. Consequently, Professor Kahan, the individual who led the IEEE 754 Standards Committee, came up with an algorithm for adding positive floating point numbers without necessarily having the need to sort them first. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the implementation of this, but essentially what happens here is that in performing the sum, we also try to keep track of any error, and that error is stored in the compensation. And then we try to adjust the calculation by adding that compensation and then subtracting it off again 
with every subsequent sum. Now, if you want to actually take a look at this algorithm, you can take a look at the Wikipedia page. Now, for example, suppose we want to now multiply two numbers that are real or approximations of real numbers. Well, now we do have to worry about the exponent. So consequently, rather than leaving them in this representation, let's actually calculate those two exponents. Consequently, if you were to perform multiplication on these two, we would get the following. The result ends up being 6.658048 times 10 to the 1 plus 2, which is equal to that result times 10 to the 3, and that is equal to that result times 10 to the 52 minus 49. Once again, if we want to store this in our representation, we have to round to four significant digits. Thus, the representation is 526658. Now, suppose we want to find the reciprocal of this particular number. All right, so with the exponent being 49, you know that this is going to be the reciprocal of 5.492. Thus, we're going to calculate. We have that expression reciprocated being 1 over 5.492. Calculating that, we can see that that is approximately equal to this value, and that is equal to 1.8208 and change times 10 to the negative 1, and that's equal to that result times 10 to the 48 minus 49. 48 minus 49 is negative 1. However, once again, we must store this with only four significant digits, and therefore we will round. Thus, the reciprocal of the number above is approximately the number we see here, 481821, or 0.1821. Now, what is the re reciprocal of that result? Well, let's calculate it again. We have 0 0.1821. So again, we calculate that result. And if we were to calculate that, that would be approximately 5.491488193 and change. This is, of course, times 10 to the 0, which is equal to that result times 10 to the 49 minus 49. Consequently, if we store this to four significant digits, we get this value here. Now, wait a second. If you go back to the previous slide, you'll notice something interesting. The number above was calculated as the reciprocal of 5.492. Thus, we have another weakness with floating point numbers. It is not necessarily true that the reciprocal of the reciprocal is equal to the original number. You may deduce from this also that if we calculate a product, x times y, and divide that result by y, that may not actually end up being equal to x. Suppose we want to approximate the derivative of sine of x at x equals 1. So let us approximate this with sine of x plus h minus sine of x 
all over h with, with h being as small as possible for the representation we have. So in this case, the smallest h we could add to one that gives us a different number is 0 0.001. The correct value of this approximation of the of the derivative of sine at x equals 1 is 0 0.53988 or to four digits of precision by 0 0.5399. Let's try to calculate this. So we calculate sine at our first value and sine at our second value and there is the denominator 0.001 in our floating point representation. Now when we calculate sine at those two values we can only store those values to four significant digits. So essentially 0.8420 minus 0.8415. Calculating that difference, we get 0 0.0005 over 0 0.001. This works out to be 0 0.5 or 1 half. We were trying to use a formula that should have given us an approximation of at least something close to 0 0.54, but we only got 0 0.5. So even though with every single calculation, the maximum error that was introduced or resulting from the representation would have been 0 0.05%, and we did one, two, three, four computations, the fourth of which doesn't even introduce any error. Four computations caused the relative error of the answer to jump to 7.4% relative error. How did we go from 0.05% relative error to seven and a 0.4% relative error. Well, the issue here is that to get the correct value, these numbers here are only stored to four decimal digits and the first two, almost a third, are the same. The problem is if we wanted to actually get to 0 0.5399, we would have to have an additional three decimal digits of precision in both the calculations in the numerator. At this point, if we now subtracted those two, we would actually get 0 0.5399 but we needed more precision. The problem here is we are subtracting two numbers that are relatively close to each other. So this is something we will be avoiding in the future. So the rule is do not use algorithms that require you to subtract very similar floating point numbers to get an accurate answer. Consequently, from these examples we have seen, we note that if we use a floating point representation of real numbers, then e each arithmetic operation we perform, first, may introduce additional rounding errors, but not only that, it may not even follow the rules of algebra. So x plus y may equal x even if y is not equal to zero. And given a list of numbers, the order in which you add them may actually make a significant differ difference. 
So consequently, throughout this course, we will need to take steps to mitigate as much as possible the effect that results from using floating point numbers in our calculations. Now, we're storing many more digits of precision with a double, but we're also going to be approximating larger systems or simulating larger systems using the double precision floating point format. So if we want to get better approximations or more accurate calculations, one step is to store more digits. So there is a data type called float and it is also based on the 754 standard like double but it doesn't have very much precision. It doesn't have enough precision for engineering computations. It's more or less only really useful for graphics. It uses four bytes and the errors are not sufficiently horrible so that if you are rendering an image, it's still going to appear the same whether or not you use float or double. The only point is float only uses half as much memory. The name double that you have already used comes from the phrase double precision floating point numbers, suggesting it has approximately twice as many significant bits as a float. This is more or less appropriate for most engineering computations as long as once again we have appropriately designed algorithms and that is what the balance of this course will entail. The type long double actually occupies 10 bytes instead of 8, having even more accurate results. However, in most engineering cases it's not necessary to go to this extreme. There's even something called a quad or quadruple precision floating point number, but it is seldom implemented. Now, something interesting here. If you perform or write a piece of C code that calculates with doubles, the calculation of those doubles is actually performed inside something called the floating point unit similar to the arithmetic logic unit, but one devoted to floating point computations. This processor actually has internal registers, and in some cases, these internal registers actually occupy 10 bytes, the long double or extended double, instead of a double. Consequently, your calculations on such a processor may actually be more accurate than you expect. Now, the issue, however, is as soon as you store it back on the stack, it's, it must be converted back to the precision of a double. So once again, it's up to the compiler to optimize the implementation of any such algorithms to ensure that floating point computations occur entirely within the floating point unit. But that also is significantly beyond the scope of this course. Now let's go back to our representation. Once again, we required that the exponent went from 0 to 98, and this represents this number here. You will recall, however, that we required that the leading digit, the integer component, is non-zero. Why was this done? Well, easily enough, if we didn't have this restriction, there would actually be multiple representations of the same value. So, for example, all of these representations would store the value 1, because the first value is 1 
times 10 to the 0. The second is 0.1 times 10 to the 1. The third being 0 0.01 times 10 to the 2. And the last being 0 0.001 times 10 to the 3, all of which are equal to 1. Having multiple representations of the same value is a problem. Thus, if we require that the integer component is non-zero in our representation, that guarantees a unique representation within our format. Consequently, we can compare two floating point numbers to see if they are equal simply by comparing the digits. All right, so therefore we know immediately that because these two floating point numbers have different digits, they represent two different values. But which one of these two is now larger than the other? Well, the hard way to go about this is to actually determine what the two values are and say perhaps subtract one from the other and see if the result is positive or negative. But that was actually performing a lot of computations just to see which is larger. Fortunately, however, because we put the exponent first and then the integer component and the mantissa, mantissa following it, we don't have to interpret the numbers. We actually just look at the integer representation and we immediately see that 155932 as an integer is less than 237184 as an integer, and therefore the second number is larger than the first. That's nice. What this means is that if one floating point representation is larger as an integer than another, then the floating point number it re represents is also larger than the floating point number represented by the second. This is nice because this is a computation that can be easily performed in hardware if we are comparing two floating point numbers. That's also a nice design feature. So, for example, suppose you were asked to sort these eight different representations of real numbers in our floating point representation. I don't care what these numbers represent. In order to sort them, all I do is sort them as if they were integers, and the result will be correct. The smallest is the first, which is 2.515 times 10 to the 14 minus 49. The largest is 7.600 times 10 to the 85 minus 49. That's a much more convenient way to sort than to actually try to interpret the numbers as the real values that they are attempting to approximate. Now, recall from ECE 150 the behavior of integer arithmetic. Integer arithmetic may result in an overflow or an underflow or a carry, which would then wrap the result around. Similarly, if you were to perform a division by zero with integers, you get an exception that terminates execution of the program. Well, for floating point numbers, it would be quite horrible if you were performing Gaussian elimination or back and backward substitution and adding one to the largest possible float, having that result in the largest possible negative float. That sounds horribly suboptimal. Not only that, suppose you accidentally divided by a very small number 
And that small number ended up getting smaller and smaller until it ended up being zero. Dividing by zero might actually cause an issue if that terminated the program. So there are features of IEEE 754 that allow us to deal with very large and very small numbers. Now recall in our representation that we required n to be a non-zero digit. Consequently, this number would be a unique representation of a positive value. So how do we represent zero? Well, we're going to represent zero with this value here, where all the digits are themselves zero. Now this may have, however, seem to cause an issue because we now have two different representations of zero, plus zero and minus zero. Why would we want two representations of zero? After all, with integers in your previous course on the fundamentals of programming, you saw that we used two's complement to get rid of the second representation of zero. Well, we're going to use plus zero to represent small positive values. So suppose we had a value like positive 10 to the negative 107. That value cannot be stored in our representation, but it is positive. Negative zero is going to represent very small negative values like negative 10 to the to 110. Negative 10 to the exponent 110 cannot be represented in this format and therefore it will be represented by negative zero. Now, with any other consequences, uh, with any other numbers, if x is non-zero, x plus positive zero is still x, and x plus negative zero is still x. Also, remember that we required that the exponent not be 99. The exponent went from 0 to 98, and consequently we now can use 99 for something else. We are going to represent plus or minus infinity with plus or minus 99 with three zeros, or four zeros. Thus, we will interpret this number differently from all other representations. Now, this is going to be the result if we either add or multiply two very large numbers such that the result can no longer be stored in our representation. If we perform such a computation, this will result in positive infinity being stored in our representation. Note that we can still do arithmetic with infinity. For example, plus infinity plus any value of x is equal to positive infinity as long as x is not equal to negative infinity. Negative infinity plus x is still negative infinity so long as x is less than positive infinity. X, uh, infinity times x is still infinity so long as x is greater than zero. Infinity times x is equal to negative infinity if x is less than zero. One divided by positive zero becomes positive infinity, while one divided by negative zero becomes negative infinity. Similarly, one divided by positive infinity becomes positive zero, 
while 1 divided by negative infinity becomes negative 0. Now, what happens if we perform a calculation that results in an indeterminate value? So from secondary school, you know that 0 divided by 0 is not plus or minus infinity, it's indeterminate. You have no idea what it should represent. The same happens is if you divide infinity by infinity or multiply infinity by zero, or in this case, add infinity to negative infinity. All of these result in an indeterminate value. It would be wrong to store any of these computations as either plus or minus infinity, plus or minus zero, or any other real number. Consequently, we need another representation. All of these indeterminate results will be stored differently. They are called in the parlance of numerical algorithms as not a number or NAN. To represent a not a number, we will use 9910000. All right. So if the first two digits of our floating point number are 99 and all subsequent digits are 0, it represents plus or minus infinity depending on the sign. If the sign is positive, the exponent is 99 and the integer component is 1 with everything else 0, that is going to represent not a number. And so if you were to calculate 0 divided by 0, that will give this result. So we now have three special values when the first two digits are 9, 9. The IEEE standard actually reserves all other representations for something else but that is beyond the scope of this course. Finally, and this is the end of the tunnel, the smallest number in our representation is 00100. This is the smallest possible value that is positive that can be stored in our representation so long as the first digit there is non-zero. And this represents 10 to the negative 49. Now, this is a problem because here we have four significant digits. But if we divided this by 2, it could not be represented as a non-zero value. And so this value divided by 2 ends up being 0. This is a problem. There's another issue. And that other issue is that two numbers may be different, but their difference may end up being zero if we require that first digit to be non-zero. Consequently, in IEEE 754, if the exponent is 0, we are actually going to allow the first digit, the integer component, to be 0. So consequently, we can still represent smaller numbers than what we have. These are called denormalized numbers. So, so, for example, if the first digit is 0, this represents 0 dot mmm times 10 to the negative 49, which in our scientific notation is something times 10 to the negative 50. If we have 
two leading zeros, this represents something times 10 to the negative 51. Notice now we can store numbers this small only with two digits of precision, not four. So the relative error becomes significantly larger. If the first three digits are zero, this represents some integer times 10 to the negative 52. Finally, notice that if all four digits are zero, this actually does represent zero. Now, with each additional leading zero in this denormalized representation, the relative error is increased. But the relative error is not 100%, which is what it would be if we just simply represented all numbers less than 10 to the negative 49 with zero. Also, this has one very nice fringe benefit. With the floating point representation, x minus y is equal to zero if and only if x equals y. All right, to summarize our design, plus or minus infinity are represented by 990000. And if we ever perform any calculation that is too large to be represented in this format, we will default to one of these two. 991000 represents not a number and will be the result of any calculation such as infinity minus infinity, zero divided by zero, or zero times infinity, or infinity divided by infinity anything that is normally considered indeterminate. Of course, not a number plus anything is still not a number. Not a number divided by anything is still not a number, and so on and so forth. Now, if the exponent is between 0 and 98, this represents the following rational number. And this is used to approximate various real numbers on ranges to four significant digits. Again, the exponent is any value between 0 and 99 and the leading va value n, the integer component, must be non-zero. Then we have denormalized numbers. So with the leading integer component being non-zero, all of those values are normalized, meaning that there's only one representation. However, in the special case where the exponent is 0, 0, and the integer component is zero, the mantissa will still continue to represent a non-zero value, only with increased relative error. Also, plus or minus zero represents numbers that are smaller than can be represented even by the smallest denormalized number. Now, problems with a floating point representation. We have seen that real numbers can only be represented, at least with normalized representations, with a relative error no greater than 0 0.05, but still there is a relative error. Each time we perform any sort of arithmetic calculation, this increases the error x plus y can equal x even if y is not equal to 0. x plus y plus z may result in a different value depending on what order we add them in. So it's no longer associative. And similar issues with multiplication and division. 
So for example, the reciprocal of the reciprocal of x may no longer equal the original value of x. Now we can go back to that double precision floating point representation I described at the very start of this lecture. We have 64 bits with the first bit being the sign bit, 11 bits representing the exponent, and 52 bits representing the mantissa. So if the exponent goes between 1 and 2046, which is 2 to the 11 minus 1 at uh, minus 2, this represents the following binary number. It is, of course, rational, but we will use it to approximate real numbers. Now, for our representation, we required that the leading integer component be non-zero, but the only non-zero binary number is one. So we don't even have to store this value. We will simply assume that the 52 trailing bits are the mantissa, and there is an assumed one in the integer component. Also, you will notice that the bias is 1023. That's 1024 minus 1. The sign bit can simply be represented as negative 1 raised to the sign bit, because negative 1 raised to the power 0 is positive 1, negative 1 raised to the power 1 is negative 1. Now, if all of the bits in the exponent are 0, this is now going to be used to represent both denormalized floating point numbers, but also plus or minus 0. So if all the bits, the 52 trailing bits are 0, this is going to represent 0. If there is even 1 well, it just represents this number here. Now, there's a slight subtle difference. The exponent here now has to be 1 minus the bias and not simply negative of the bias. That's not really important, but you can probably figure out why that is necessary. Similarly, if all of the exponent bits are 1, and all of the mantissa bits are 0. This will represent plus or minus infinity. If all of the bits in the exponent are 1, and only the first bit of the mantissa is 1, with all others being 0, this represents not a number. So here is our not a number for double precision floating point numbers. All right, so from these definitions, we may deduce that the largest non infinity floating point number is going to be this representation here. This represents plus or minus. 1.11111 with 52 ones in the mantissa times 2 to the that number minus the bias. You'll notice that the number above is actually twice the bias, so it's just 2 to the bias. However, 1.111111 1 is the binary equivalent of 9.99999, which is a going to be approximately, in this case, 2. So this is approximately 2 to the 1024. This is approximately 1.8 times 10 to the 308, plus or minus.
that's a reasonably large number. Actually, it's larger than a Google cubed. The smallest normalized number is this number here. Now, it represents 1.0 times 2 to the 1 minus the bias, which is equal to plus or minus 2 to the negative 1022, because the bias is negative 1023. This is approximately equal to plus or minus 2.23 times 10 to the negative 308. Thus, we appear to be able to represent with maximal precision numbers on an extremely large range of real numbers, as small as 10 to the negative 308 and as large as 10 to the 308. The smallest non-zero denormalized number is this value here. This represents this number here, which is, again, approximately 4.94 times 10 to the negative 324. Just like with our representation, as there are more and more leading zeros, the number of significant digits goes down and therefore the relative error increases, but that's better than approximating any of the values on this small interval by zero. Also, we are guaranteed that the difference of any two double precision floating point numbers that are not equal to each other, that difference will be non-zero. You will never get one double minus another double equaling zero if the two doubles are not equal. Now you don't have to remember these numbers exactly. It's probably easiest enough to remember that double precision floating point numbers store numbers approximately on the range from 10 to the negative 300 up to 10 to the 300. The maximum relative error is 2 to the negative 32, 33. This is approximately equal to 1.11 times 10 to the negative 16, which is a very small relative error. And this is also known as the machine epsilon for the double precision floating point representation. Let's try adding two such numbers now. Both of these are double precision floating point numbers. They are both normalized. So we have a mantissa and an exponent, and there is an implied integer 1 to the left of the radix point. Also, taking a look at the exponent, we notice that the exponent for the first of these two is 1 less than the second. So recall that 111 plus 1 is 1000. Zero, zero. All right, so the second has an exponent that is exactly one higher than the first. All right, so we can now write down both of these numbers without the multiplier. Instead, we are assuming both of these are multiplied by the second exponent. So times two to whatever that is minus what the bias. The first one being one lower in exponent is shifted to the the decimal or radix point is shifted one to the left. We can now add these two together. And again, this is just binary addition. And the result is as follows. All right, so now the decimal or radix point has been moved one to the right. We now have one zero point a mantissa. Well, consequently, we are going to have to add one more to the larger of the two exponents. So the sum will have an exponent that is one larger than the exponent of the second. But not only that, the mantissa is going to be 
zero one zero 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 one which we get from the sum again we will exclude the leading integer component one and only store the mantissa so therefore the result will be as follows let's try it with another example here we take a look at these two numbers and the first number has an exponent that is three higher than the second therefore we're going to have to shift the radix point on the second one so being three higher to the in the with the first the first is larger by approximately a factor of eight so Looking at the mantissa and adding the implied leading one, the first represents 1.0011011 times two to that exponent minus the bias. But we don't care because these are all relative. For the second one, we have 1.010101, but once again, we have to shift that, we have to make that smaller by a factor of eight or two to the three. And so we shift the points over. So we are adding these two numbers together. Adding these two number numbers gives us this result. And we notice that the radix point is still next to the leading one. Therefore, the exponent is not going to change. Thus, the sum of these two numbers will have the same exponent as the larger number above, and the mantissa will be the mantissa of the sum which we see here. Thus, if we were to add these two numbers, this would be the result. Let's try multiplying two numbers that are in the floating point representation. The first one here is, well, taking a look at the exponent, the exponent is too higher than the bias. So whatever this number is, it's going to be times two to the two. The second one has an exponent that is one less than the bias. So whatever number it is, is times two to the negative one. So now we know how to shift these numbers. Now the first number there is the implied leading one, and then from the mantissa, 1.01, and everything else is zero. We are multiplying that by two to the two, and so that's just 101. Wait a second, 101 is five, is it not? Yes, 101 is five. The second one is 1.1011, with the radix point moved one to the left because it's multiplied by two to the negative one. So the second one represents this number here in binary. Now, when multiplying these two out, it's always easier to have the multiplier being the easier number. So let's swap the two. Now, multiplying the multiplicand by the multiplier, we simply get these two values here. Again, just as per normal multiplication. And now we add the results. So this is the result here. And there are five radix points summed up between the multiplier and the multiplicand. And so we add those five radix points into the result or product. Hmm, well, let's take a look at this. We immediately note that this is four and something. So therefore the exponent will be the same as the first. And that's two higher than the bias. The mantissa will be everything after that leading one. So zero, 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 one, one, one. So the product of these two numbers is this double precision floating point number we see here. 
Now we can actually check this. Here's what we were trying to multiply and there is the product. The first number we saw is 5. Now the second number is a half of plus a quarter plus a sixteenth plus a thirty-second. And we can calculate that as that result. Well, I can multiply five times that and I get 4.2 and change. All right, let's go into MATLAB to confirm our answer. In MATLAB, we have the following. First, let's print it out in hexadecimal format. So let's just print out five in a hexadecimal format. Uh, so five in hexadecimal is 4014. Well, taking a look at the exponent, we see, yes, that exponent, the first four bits is 0100, which is four. Then there are four, ones, uh, four zeros, and then there are three zeros and a one, which is one. But most importantly, notice that the mantissa is four and one zero one zero zero is the binary for four as well. Our second number is that, and we see, ah, yes, that's one less than the bias. The bias is actually 3FF, and we note that that is indeed the binary representation of B. Finally, the product of the two is this value here, and we do see that the exponent is unchanged, and 0E is four zeros followed by three ones and a zero. And that's what we got in our answer. All right, so we have confirmed that we were able to successfully multiply these two floating point numbers.